and welcome back to church. Here at FVFC, we're delighted to welcome you to our service and we're looking forward to worshipping with each of you today. This coming Tuesday is the first of our open house toddler group meetings. They start this Tuesday, which is the 7th of September, so don't miss out on those. If you've got a little one running around your feet right now and you think that they would enjoy it, Why don't you come down and join us and enjoy a coffee and making new friends. Also, on the 7th of September, the same day, (laughs) we have our monthly prayer meeting. Now, this will be the first time that we've met in person since before the pandemic to pray. And we'll be hosting that here, 7.30, at the church at FVFC. If you are unable to join us, you can join via Zoom. And we will be sending out the links for that in our email this week. Next Sunday, Sunday the 12th of September, this is our relaunch Sunday service. And we're really hoping that as many of you as possible will come down and join us, not just for the service, but also stay on and enjoy the barbecue, bouncy castle, crafts, all different things for all ages. You'll be able to find out some of the exciting things that we've got planned for the year ahead. So why don't you join us that Sunday? Now today, we're having communion within our service. And if you would like to join us in taking communion this morning, you might want to pause me right now, run off and grab some bread or a biscuit or even a dry cracker and whatever you have to drink at hand. And once you've got them, just put them down beside you and press play again. (laughs) Our theme this morning is serving one another. We've been looking, haven't we, at this Together series about becoming a one another community, community serving God. And we've looked at loving one another, forgiving one another, living in harmony with one another. And today we finish with serving one another. If you've missed any of those services and you'd like to catch up, you can go back and view them on our YouTube channel. In the late 1800s, a large group of European pastors came together for one of D.L. Moody's conferences. Following the European custom, each of the guests put their shoes outside their doors when they went to bed at night. And it was meant to be that the servants, the hall servants, would come by and clean the shoes and put them back. Now, because this was America, there weren't any hall servants. And walking the dormitory at night, Moody saw that the shoes had been put out and he didn't want his comrades to be embarrassed. So what he did was he mentioned to a few people that the shoes needed cleaning. He mentioned it to a few of the students that were around, and he was met with pious excuses and reasons why they couldn't help. So Moody returned to the dorm, and he was walking around gathering the shoes. He went back to his own room, and he started to polish and clean each of them. He was the only famous preacher, the only famous evangelist there was at the time, really. And there he was cleaning all these shoes. We would never have heard about this story if it wasn't for an unexpected visit from one of his friends late in the evening. When the foreign visitors got up in the morning, they opened their doors and they found their shoes all shined and beautiful. They never knew who had done it. Moody didn't tell anyone, but his friend told a couple of people. And during the rest of the conference, different men volunteered to shine the shoes in secret. I wonder if this is why God used Moody so vitally in his mission to spread the gospel. He was a man with a servant's heart, and that was the basis of his true greatness. Of all the one another's that we have looked at, serving one another is perhaps the one that best characterizes the essence of Christian ministry. With the way that the world is at the moment, it is, however, very often obscured by the warning to look out for ourselves, to think of ourselves before anyone else. But the Bible tells us that we have been set free 
so that we can serve and love others. This morning, we're going to explore just what it looks like for us to be servants of one another. And we're going to follow the example that Jesus sets for us and his disciples. Why don't we pray for our service today? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are able to come together in this place. Though we are scattered, we pray that the power of your Holy Spirit would be present where we are. Lord God, that we would know your mighty power in our lives and that you would open our eyes and our hearts to receive from you today. Amen. Today's reading is from Galatians chapter 5, reading verses 13 to 26, using the NIV. Life by the Spirit. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbour as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Amen. Dear Father God, as we come before you this morning, we want to lift your name above all that is going on in this world. We want to thank you for the gift of Jesus, who has changed our lives by his love for us all. We give thanks for the privilege of knowing you, Father, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Please forgive us when we get things wrong, overreact, are cross with others, say the wrong thing, whatever we do that causes us to sin and not demonstrate your love to this hurting world. Your word says that if we confess our wrongdoings, you will forgive us. Lord Jesus, we want to bring this world to your attention. We are aware of the wars, rumours of wars, famine, natural disasters and life-changing viruses that plague us all. Your word says we should not worry or be concerned, but that we must trust in you. So as we pray, we ask you, please have mercy on the war-torn countries, on those who are starving or lack clean water, on those who are trying to cope with out-of-control wildfires severe flooding, earthquakes, hurricanes and tropical storms, drought and the current pandemic. We pray for the missionary organisations and agencies around this world. Equip your people to be of help to others in all these circumstances. Pour out your love and grace on all those in need. BMS have reminded us to pray for Bangladesh as they cope with the end of the monsoon season. We also pray for 
those other missions we support, Operation Agri, MAF and Release International. We at this church play a very small part in supporting these organisations and ask that you will bless them mightily in all they do for you in often very difficult circumstances. We pray also for our local community, those who are grieving, in hospital, living alone, or their mental health is causing problems. Pour out your peace and provide reassurance that you, Lord, are their help in such times of trouble. And finally, we pray for this church and ask for your continued guidance and help as begin as we begin to build again on its foundations to bring people into your kingdom as well as take your word out into the surrounding areas. We pray for Ali and Rich and their family. Please continue to guide and protect them as they serve you here in Findon Valley. Amen. So this morning we're looking at the command to serve one another. Having already looked at loving one another, forgiving one another, living in harmony with one another, this again is a command that doesn't come very easily to us. Have any of you watched Downton Abbey? It's one of my absolute favourites, I love it, and during lockdown I binged on it a little bit and watched the whole thing over again. 
in this series, we meet the servants that belong to the house at Downton, don't we? And there are varying duties that they carry out. But those working closest to the family obviously have the highest status of all. And the more senior the post, the grander the station. Status and class, they are still so much a part of our society, aren't they? We want to be known. We want to be seen as someone within the society that we belong to. How others perceive us hasn't become any less important to us. And the idea of being perceived as someone's servant doesn't always conjure up very positive images in our minds. We tend to think of endless menial tasks, don't we? Cleaning up other other people's messes and, and catering to their very whim. It's easy to think of a servant as someone bent over, crushed in spirit, and someone who's been stripped away of all their dignity. Someone who's been mistreated, perhaps, or taken for granted. Someone who has no ambition for themselves, even, or low skill, Maybe they've got a small voice and no will of their own. What do you think of when you think of a servant? The New Testament gives us a a far better view of servanthood than anything that we can imagine. It draws a picture that is completely different from the one that I've just described. So much so that the apostles, they chose to picture themselves as servants. They commended their fellow ministers for being servants. And Paul says to us in our reading today from Galatians that we are called, each one of us, to be servants of one another. Now this morning, again in these verses, we see that there is a command to obey, an example to follow, and an identity to assume. The command is always the easy bit, isn't it? The command is to serve one another. And it goes beyond the command to love one another, to forgive one another, to live in harmony with one another even. We are commanded to become servants of one another. Let's have a little look again at what it says. You, my brothers, were called to be free, but, you do, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. Now, Paul, he's writing to the church in Galatia, and they've been divided by issues of Torah observance. Many of the leaders were requiring non-Jewish Christians to live by Jewish laws. They were missing the point of the gospel message. And Paul, he's reminding them that Jesus has fulfilled the law and that he has reconciled everyone who believes in him. You see, when we trust in Jesus as our Messiah, his life and death and resurrection become ours, don't they? And this is what Paul is reminding them of, that they are new creations free from the laws and the old covenant. Interestingly, our English Bibles, they they tone down the translation of Paul's words. They make them easier for us to swallow. A literal translation of the end of Galatians 5.13 would read, so use your freedom by making yourself slaves of one another in love. Now, there's a word that conjures up a whole range of negative pictures in our minds, doesn't it? What do you picture when you hear the word slave? For me, I said it not just the other day to my daughter. What did your last slave die of when she was asking me to do a load of things for her? Is this how Paul wants us to live and feel about the way in which we interact with each other? Are we to apply these directives that he gives us in this negative way? Well, thankfully, no. Paul isn't calling for oppression here. He's not giving permission for us to enslave one another to our will. Paul is calling for servanthood, not servitude. You see, the difference here is is having to and 
wanting to. There's a big difference, and servitude is imposed from the outside. Someone forces you to to serve them into servanthood. But servanthood grows from our hearts. It grows and blossoms out of our own desire, rooted in our love of God and for others. Paul isn't talking about an obligation here for us today or a duty that we have to one another. Rather, he's talking about what we should really want to do. We make ourselves servants of one another because we love them, because we love each other and because he first loved us. And so we desire to serve them as best we can. Unfortunately, much like all of the other one and others that we have looked at in this series, this one also doesn't come easily to us. It's not something that we do naturally. It goes against our human nature and we fight against it every step of the way. You see, it's in our nature to want the spotlight. We want centre stage. We want the attention. We want people to know the things that we do. We want the credit and the glory for doing them. Our fleshly nature doesn't want to be the servant. It wants to be served. And that's why Paul wants us to to really see this command as something that we need to take hold of. He's saying that our flesh literally wants us not to do it. Our flesh has become corrupted by our selfish nature. And it's focused entirely on what it wants and what it needs and its own appetites. We live in a culture, don't we, that is all about me and mine and myself. Bill Hybels, in his book, Descending into Greatness, says this. That in our culture, answers are wrapped around our appetites. Does this fulfill my needs? Does it satisfy my physical hunger? Quench my thirst for more? Feed my lust for power? In the midst of all these appetites coursing around within us, clamoring to be fed, comes this command for us to serve one another. Paul says, get rid of the idol of self. Think about other people first. Set your own desires aside. Don't worry about the attention, the credit, or the glory. Just do what needs to be done. Serve one another in love. So how do we do this? How do we go about this? Where do we go for the example? As far as I can see, this is a pretty radical request of Paul, a pretty radical command, because it goes against everything that this world is telling us at the moment. Paul's literally saying that in order for us to get higher, we need to go lower. And just like we saw in that example from D.L. Moody earlier on, the path to true greatness is paved with humble service, Great leaders are great servants. The last shall be first is achieved through putting others first. And it turns this conventional wisdom of our culture upside down. And just like Paul, this was as important to Jesus. Jesus tried really hard to impress this upon his disciples, didn't he? And in Matthew 20, they they get into a big fight about who would be the most important disciple, who would get to sit on the seat of honour right next to Jesus in his kingdom. And they were arguing over this position of power. Let's have a listen to what Jesus says to them. He says, God doesn't rate status or power. If you want to be great in God's eyes, this is how you have to become. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first 
must be your slave. So the command is to become a servant. But what does that actually look like? Well, in Philippians 2, 5 to 8, it tells us that being a servant is as much about attitude as it is action. And it's here that we find our example today. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. You see, Paul is showing us that to be servant-like, we must once again take on that Christ-like mindset. We must take on that Christ-like attitude towards each other and follow the example that he sets for us. So what did Jesus do? How did he demonstrate his servanthood? Well, firstly, he didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, did he? Even though he, in very nature, was God, he had the attitude that said he would serve and not be served. And he's saying that we should take on that attitude for ourselves. He says, don't let position or status or superior qualities and skills get in the way of serving each other. Don't start looking for status, but rather display humility. Secondly, Jesus made himself nothing. He took the very nature of a servant upon himself. Having the attitude of Jesus begins with a choice, a choice of the heart. You see, he purposefully laid aside what was rightfully his, the status that was rightfully his, and came as a human baby, even though he was still God. And he chose to grow and live as a man and suffer a humiliating and cruel death for each of us. When we serve one another, it's important to resist getting caught up in a sense of entitlement, but rather to give ourselves sacrificially, even when it means doing something that we may not really want to do. And it's in these times that we've got to be really careful that we don't just make an act of it. We don't just do it resenting the thought of having to do it but rather that we are servants to the very core, to our very nature. Having a servant heart is essential to Christian living. That's what Paul's telling us today. When we serve, we find our purpose in life. We can show those around us that the way things are is not the way that God intended them to be. God didn't create us to have an appetite driven by selfish desires. You see, when Christ is at the center of our lives, we rediscover our original purpose, God's purpose for us. We were created and made for love. Every week we've looked at these one another's, we've seen that that is our true identity, haven't we? We are made for relationship. We were made to fulfill and complete one another, to work together. And serving is an integral part of that. In my bathroom, I have these beautiful candles. And they have these really lovely dried flowers pressed into them. Now, they aren't just any candles, they're M&S candles. And I can't bear to light them because I like them so much, because I know that once they're lit, they're going to burn down and eventually they're going to run out. They're going to burn up. But the truth is, they're created to be lit. And by not lighting them, actually, I'm missing out on seeing them in their full glory, as they were created to be. We are beautifully and exquisitely created. 
for a most noble purpose. You see, when we don't serve, our lives aren't doing what they were created to do. And the danger is that we will become like my candles unlit. Our spiritual lives will become stagnant because we're not sharing the abundance of what God has generously given to us. Instead, we try to hold on to what we have Hold on to what we've received from God so that we don't burn out, so that we protect ourselves. And we become like the flowers pressed into the wax. But Jesus shows us that we are to be channels of his goodness. As I have loved you, he says, so you must love one another. And when we serve, we will keep ourselves burning bright we will be filled afresh with his Holy Spirit, revealing the beauty that is pressed into us. Those fruits of his spirit that Paul speaks about in the verses below ours, and it says, you will express love and joy and peace and forbearance and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. God's grace and his love will flow through you to others. Which brings us to love again, which of course is always our identity. When you love one another, when you forgive one another, when you live in harmony with one another, you become more like Jesus. And that is our ultimate goal, is it not? Jesus, in, he's the greatest picture, the greatest example of how we are to become and to live and to act. He gives us the greatest picture of servanthood. And when you serve, you become more like him. After telling his disciples that the way to become great was to be servants, He said that he didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for all. Later on, he gives us an even greater example of his desire to serve. In John 13, we read that Jesus gets up from a meal And he takes off his outer clothing and he wraps a towel around his waist and he gets a basin of water and he begins to wash the feet of the disciples. He dries them lovingly with a towel. What a picture. For us to truly appreciate it, we need to step back in time just for a moment. You see, when they were sitting there at these meals with their feet... It was a time when the roads were terrible. They were filthy. They were full of mud and dust. And they would have had that mud and dust all up their legs, all the way up their calves from where they had travelled from. And when you arrived somewhere for a meal, it was custom for somebody to be there washing the feet and the ankles of those arriving. When they, if there wasn't a, someone there to wash them, usually that responsibility fell to the first guest who had arrived. But there wasn't anyone offering to wash the feet of the disciples that day. Not only had they been on this long walk, but they were now sitting down at the table with filthy feet. <laughs> And not only did this, this serve a, a, a right of, of service, but it was also very practical because dinner time was spent sitting on the floor, lounging on pillows around the table. And they would have had someone's feet right next to their head. Can you imagine that? Some guy laying next to you with muddy feet and legs as you're trying to eat your dinner. And as they arrive for this Passover meal, this feast, this this festival, this time together, not one disciple takes it upon himself to wash the feet of others. Instead, they recline and they start eating with their feet unwashed. 
And we know, don't we, from Luke's gospel that this argument breaks out about who of them is the greatest. They're arguing about honour whilst they're sitting there with filthy feet. What do you think that they thought? What would you think went through their minds when Jesus got up from the table and he starts to remove his clothes and he fills the basin with water and he takes each, serve, each, each person's feet and washes them? He serves them. How do you think they felt? How would you have felt? After he's finished, Jesus tells them this. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asks them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that's who I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So our command today is to serve one another. Our example is to be Christ-like, not seeking status, but displaying humility. Our identity is to love as Christ has loved us, sacrificially. Who is there like you? Who is there like you? And who else would give their life for me? Even suffering. Oh
come to the communion part of our service this morning, we hope that as you participate in it with us, you will have a real sense of God's presence with you where you are. And as we remember his death and resurrection in the bread and the wine, we will really know the power of his Holy Spirit. So just as we come to this table, let's be quiet for just a moment and prepare our hearts. In Revelation 3.20, it says, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them, and they with me. This meal is not the idea of the church. It was initiated by Jesus for all of those who love him and those who want to love him more. So come if you have much, and come if you have little. Come if your faith is strong, or if you, in these times, feel that your faith is weak. Come if you have been here often, and come if you've not been here often enough. Come if you have tried to follow Jesus, and come if you feel like you have failed. Come not because it's me inviting you to this table, but because Jesus himself invites each one of us. And it is his will for those who seek him that they will do that. As we come, let us remember that there are things that we may well have done and said that we wish we hadn't, that we know we shouldn't have. Why don't we ask God now in these moments of quietness, to forgive us for the things that we have done wrong as we we talk to him about that in our own hearts. We come to the God who we know answers prayer, who we know forgives us all. And so, Father, we come to you this day recognising the things that we have done wrong, things that have not brought you glory, and so in this moment, Father God, we, we ask for your forgiveness afresh. I ask that we, you would strengthen us to live our lives better, lives that truly reflect you to others around us. Father, help us to act justly, to walk humbly with you. You say, to those who confess their sins, you are faithful and just to forgive. And we pray now that you would cleanse us all from unrighteousness. As we receive that fresh, uh, that fresh forgiveness now, may the peace of the Lord be with each one of you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took the bread And when he had given thanks for it, he broke it and he said, this is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this is the cup in the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Jesus then prayed a prayer of thanksgiving, and why don't we do that together now? Father, we give thanks that though we are scattered and not all yet together, we are still one body because of the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for what you did for each one of us on the cross. And we pray that we will never lose the wonder of that. Thank you that when we were still far off from you, you met us in your son and brought us home. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts today. And all praise and all glory and all honour goes to you. Amen. Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. Please, where you are, will you now join me 
in eating the bread. As we do this, we recognize that Jesus, the Savior of the world, died for you and me so that we can know his healing in our lives. After the supper, he took the cup and he said that this is the new covenant in my blood. We remember that Jesus will come again. And so as we drink together now, we are reminded that Jesus is alive and that the hope that we have is that he will come again. Let's drink together now. Father God, you know that each one of us has people in our lives that we care about, that we love, but we are also worried about. Then we want to now lift those people up to you. And in doing so, we know that you are a God who answers prayers. And so we entrust them afresh to you. Amen. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the
In a certain pond on a farm were two ducks and a frog. These neighbours were the best of friends. All day long they used to play together, and as the summer days came to an end, the pond began to dry up. There was so little water that eventually they realised that they were going to have to move on to another place. The ducks could easily fly away, but the frog, he would be stuck there. Finally, the ducks, they decided they would hold a stick between their bills and the frog could hang on to the stick with his mouth. And they would fly him over to another pond. This is what they did. And as they were flying along with the frog clinging to the stick in his mouth, A farmer out on his field looked up and he saw them and he said, well, isn't that clever? I wonder who thought of that? To which the frog replied, I did. The frog didn't have a servant heart. Jesus said that he had come to serve and not to be served. And that is what we too are to do with our lives. So let's make sure that we use our lives properly. Let's not misuse them. Let's not stop serving and hold on to what we have been given, terrified of burning out. But let's make our lives count. Let's voluntarily, cheerfully, generously, lovingly serve one another. Not because we have to, but because we want to because Christ first served us. So that draws to a close our Together series. And again, if you would like to revisit any of the sermons that we have had over the last few weeks, you can do that through our YouTube channel. Please do come down and join us next Sunday here at the church and stay on for the barbecue and all the activities that will follow the service. You can find out more information about the day on our website or on our Facebook page. So why don't you check those out? You could even like us and follow us on Facebook now. We really hope that you have enjoyed your time here with us today and we will be praying for you all throughout the week. Why don't we finish by saying the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Have a great week, everybody, and we'll see you all here next Sunday. God bless you all. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze. Like wildfire in our very souls Holy Spirit, come invade us now We are your church We need your power in us We seek your kingdom first We hunger and we to waste our lives for your our joy and prize to see the captive hearts release the hurt the sick the poor at peace we lay down our lives for heaven's course we are your church we pray revive this earth your kingdom here let the darkness fear show your mighty hand heal our streets and land set your church on fire win this nation back change the atmosphere 
darkness near Show your mighty hand Heal our streets and land Set your church